Roger. Lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading you loud and clear. Roger roll. Discovery. Discovery. Roger. No problem. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the June 5th, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Michael Abdilla, and tonight I have Tina Stagg and Angelo De Grazia here with me from the Space Association of Australia. Let's look at some Australian space news first up tonight. NASA is looking to Australian space startup Equatorial Launch Australia to conduct rocket launches. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Centre... The Wallops Flight Facility has indicated it would like to progress discussions with ELA on their 2020 sounding rocket campaign. The campaign would provide temporary Southern Hemisphere launch facilities for sounding rockets for scientific investigations. The proposed launch activities fall under the Space Activities Act 1998 and the amended Space Launches and Returns Act 2018 which comes into effect on the 31st of August 2019. The Australian Space Agency is responsible for administering this legislation, including the relevant licence and permits for launch sites and launch activities. The agency is also currently consulting with industry on draft rules under the amended Act. Ensuring the rules are in place for space activities is a priority for the agency. Australian Space Agency Chief Dr Megan Clark said NASA's interest in conducting a sounding rocket campaign in Australia shows the increasing importance of commercial launch activities from this country. As these activities build momentum, The agency will continue its focus on creating a supportive regulatory environment that fosters industry growth while ensuring public safety and consideration of our international obligations. Okay, Angelo, over to you. Across the Pacific, US space policy. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says the debate is just beginning on the agency's proposed budget amendment to fund its Artemis lunar program. Speaking at a NASA Advisory Council meeting last week, Bridenstine criticised claims that the budget amendment, which seeks an additional $1.6 billion in 2020, was dead on arrival because the House didn't include it in its appropriations bill. He noted the amendment was released the same week House appropriators marked up the bill and thus it was just not realistic for them to consider it. He said he hopes the Senate will consider the budget amendment, citing positive comments from Kansas Republican Senator Jerry Moran, who chairs the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds NASA. Meanwhile, a former senator is joining the NASA Advisory Council. Bridenstine announced that Bill Nelson will formally join the council this week. Nelson served three terms in the Senate before losing re-election to a fourth term last year and was a key figure in space policy during his time in Congress. Nelson notably led opposition to Bridenstine's nomination to be administrator in 2017, citing Bridenstine's lack of experience, but took a more favourable view of him after confirmation. Nelson, incidentally, was also a shuttle astronaut. Okay, over to Tina. Thanks, Angelo, and good evening, space fans. To NASA's Space Launch System and Orion program, the agency believes it may still be possible to launch the first SLS mission by the end of 2020, even if it retains a key test. NASA has yet to formally decide whether to retain a green-run static fire test of the SLS core stage, although outside advisors have recommended that NASA do so. NASA had proposed doing away with the test to cut several months from the vehicle's development schedule. A NASA official said last week that it can optimise that green run test, allowing the core stage to be delivered to the Kennedy Space Centre by June 2020. That could still allow a first SLS launch by the end of 2020, although everything has to go perfectly to keep that 2020 launch date. To the moon. Further to our report in Space News last week, the United States and Japan will cooperate on lunar exploration, although the details about that effort remain unclear. 
At a joint news conference in Tokyo last week with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, President Donald Trump mentioned cooperation in space exploration as one outcome of their discussions, saying they had agreed to dramatically expand cooperation in human space flight. Details of that agreement were not disclosed, although it's expected to include Japanese participation in the Lunar Gateway, likely in exchange for flying Japanese astronauts on future lunar landings. Development of lunar landers for future human missions will depart from conventional contracting approaches. In statements since NASA was directed to land humans on the moon by 2024, agency officials have talked about buying a service to transport astronauts to the lunar surface and back, rather than a NASA-led approach that uses standard government contracts. The service approach would also give companies more flexibility in coming up with designs for lunar lander systems, rather than developing individual elements of the lander that NASA would integrate. As part of its $1.6 billion budget amendment for fiscal year 2020, NASA is seeking a $1 billion to work on an integrated commercial lunar lander. In support of the new approach, NASA has selected three companies to build private moon landers for lunar science. NASA has chosen the first commercial companies that will carry the agency's equipment to the moon during its lead-up to a human landing in 2024. These are Astrobotic, Intuitive Machines and Orbit Beyond. The companies will build moon landers to ferry NASA science experiments and technology demonstrations to the lunar surface. Those flights will be the first step of the agency's ambitious Artemis program to land humans on the moon in 2024. The first mission by Orbit Beyond will launch in September 2020. The other two will launch in the summer of 2021. This is truly exciting, a new way for us at NASA to do business. Thomas Abuchin, the head of NASA's Science Missions Directorate, recently said during the announcement at the agency's Goddard Space Flight Centre in Maryland. Maxar has won a large NASA contract to build the first element of the Lunar Gateway, thanks in part to its low price. A source selection statement released by NASA after awarding the contract for the power and propulsion element showed that Maxar's price of $375 million was far below that offered by four other companies, who ranged from $565 million to $769 million. Maxar was also the only company that requested no changes to required clauses in a model contract, avoiding time-consuming negotiations. Maxar was more closely matched with Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and Sierra Nevada Corp. on technical and managerial aspects. And to NASA's commercial crew program, Boeing has completed tests of the thrusters on its Starliner commercial crew spacecraft nearly a year after suffering problems during a similar set of tests. Boeing said recently it, that it had completed hot fire testing of the spacecraft's entire propulsion system, including launch abort engines and smaller thrusters housed in a flight-like model of the Starliner's service module. That propulsion system suffered an anomaly during a similar test last June when valves failed to close completely. The tests allow the company to proceed with a pad abort test this northern summer and an uncrewed test flight scheduled for launch in mid-August. Back to Angelo. Okay, now to planetary and space science missions. NASA's Europa Clipper mission may not meet its planned 2023 launch date and could face significant cost growth. A report issued last week by NASA's Inspector General said several issues, including cost growth with the mission's instruments and workforce shortages at JPL, could delay the mission and increase its costs. Another challenge is that NASA has yet to decide on whether to launch the mission on the SLS, as requested by Congress, or use a commercial launch vehicle. The report also said a 2025 launch date for a follow-on lander mission is not feasible and that the mission's high cost threatens the balance of other planetary mission programs at the agency. US Air Force and other military defence. It's crunch time for companies competing for Air Force launch contracts. The Air Force has given United Launch Alliance 
SpaceX, Northrop Grumman and Blue Origin until August 1st to submit their bids to become one of just two launch providers that will be entrusted to carry high-value national security payloads into orbit in the decade ahead. The Air Force will select two companies with a 60-40 split to launch as many as 34 national security missions from 2022 through to the end of 2026. The company winning the largest share of launches will be the one the Air Force determines offers the overall best value, but companies say the request for proposals gives the Air Force ample discretion to determine what best value means. Very interesting. Okay, Michael. Okay, let's move across to Europe. The European Union and European Space Agency held the first meeting of their Joint Space Council in eight years last week. European officials at a news conference in Brussels avoided discussing why the Space Council, which started in 2004, had such a long lapse in meetings, but said the Council would meet yearly going forward. One likely factor driving the need for greater cooperation between the two organisations is the growing size of the European Union space budget, which projects spending of $17.9 billion from 2021 through to 2027 on programmes like Galileo and Copernicus. Moving across to Russia, and in a story we've been following closely here on Space News, Russia has its own plan for getting cosmonauts on the moon by 2030. The plan, discussed by Roscosmos head Dmitry Rogozin last month, requires the development of a booster similar in performance to NASA's space launch system Block 1B, along with the Federation crewed spacecraft already in development and future lander concepts. However, both the feasibility of the plan and the rationale for doing so have received a sceptical reaction among space industry insiders in Russia. Let's move to China. China's first Mars mission remains on track for launch in 2020. Wang Qi, director of the National Space Science Centre, said hardware for the mission, which includes an orbiter and a rover, is being integrated. The spacecraft will carry 13 instruments, ranging from a high-resolution camera on the orbiter to a ground-penetrating radar and spectrometer on the rover. Scientists have identified two possible landing sites for the mission, including one in the same region as NASA's Viking 1 and Mars Pathfinder missions. The mission has a narrow launch window in the middle of 2020 on a long March 5 rocket. Okay, over to you, Angelo. Okay, back to the United States and SpaceX. SpaceX and NASA are still working to determine the cause of a test anomaly that destroyed a Crew Dragon spacecraft. The April 20 incident took place on a SpaceX pad at Cape Canaveral during tests of the spacecraft's Super Draco abort thrusters ahead of an in-flight abort test of that spacecraft that was scheduled for this northern summer. At a committee meeting last week, NASA said the investigation is ongoing with no new details on the potential cause of the accident and what measures will be required to correct the problem. SpaceX now plans to use the Crew Dragon built for the Demo-2 crew test flight for that in-flight abort test, with Demo-2 instead using a spacecraft that was being built for the first operational mission. The schedule for those upcoming test flights remains under review. Okay, Michael. And finally tonight, LEGO has unveiled a new set to mark the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. The NASA Apollo 11 Lunar Lander set is a 1,087 brick model of the lunar lander, measuring roughly 20 centimetres wide and comes with two minifig astronauts. The module's ascent and descent stages can be separated and the model includes details like the plaque commemorating the landing. The set went on sale last week. And mine is in the post, fellas. (laughs) 
Excellent. Yeah, have you really ordered it? Yes, I have. That's brilliant. Okay, well, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Angelo. And it's back to you, Andrew. Andrew.